Uh, I'm going to speak to you about some uh, about some options for Labour on fiscal policy. I'm not particularly preach my own line here. You probably uh, get a little bored with that, but I, I'll try to be constructive. Uh, the my one of my key messages here will be that there are a number of seductive errors, seductive paths that one might go down, which I think uh, would be likely to be a mistake. Uh, and there are a couple of tough paths uh, for you. Uh, one thing I want to say is that I think the overall problem is a little bit worse than some people seem to imagine uh, in terms of the new political problem for Labour. So whilst many people in the Labour Party, I think, think that the tale goes that um, Gordon was the saviour of the international banking system and uh, that there were some necessary measures uh, taken on the side of fiscal policy to try to avoid there being mass unemployment um, uh, and that the inevitable result of those quite correct policies as you'd see them uh, was uh, that there was a deficit built up. I think that although that's a, a line which is quite commonly perceived within the Labour Party, uh, a line which is perceived by many who swing voters, particularly in the South, is that a lot of the money that was spent was wasted uh, and that, uh, that at a slightly more fundamental level it's a bit of a blow to find that the um, having having Labour having had many problems with this economic credibility in the past once one finally trusts some people Tony Blair and Gordon Brown say sometime around 1994-5 to find that those that the same set of people end up producing the worst recession that anybody can ever remember. Um, and then the most almighty blowout on the fiscal side that there's ever been. It, it is, uh, I think that the, the underlying tale there um, it places you at peril of losing your economic credibility for um, generations. So I think that they, you shouldn't be over-reliant on the thought that people are gonna give you a fair hearing on the economy. So, because rightly or wrongly, I think that there are a lot of people who perceive things according to the latter strategy, and of course it will be the coalition's attempt to paint you in that way at every opportunity that they get, and with the advantages of office, uh, they're likely to um, have some success in that. So, what kind of options might you have in respect of the fiscal consolidation? So, just to remind ourselves of something going on, so we had deficit of around 150 billion pounds to deal with, got the structural components of that, something of the order of 120 billion pounds, that's the bit, 120 billion or so that wouldn't go away uh, once you have recovery, so that's the bit which isn't really much to do with the recession per se, it's the result of longer term um, decisions, um, so, uh, and the coalition proposes to eliminate um, something around 100 billion of that, so as they would put it, they eliminate the current structural deficit, but in essence they're getting rid of 100 billion of that 120 billion deficit, and they're doing it by around 80 billion of tax rate rises, a little bit less, 77, and around 20 billion, of, sorry, around 80 billion of spending cuts, and around 20 billion of tax rises. Now, so what kind of options would you have here? So one kind of option would be simply to oppose the scale of the consolidation. So we don't need to cut things so much that we can afford to run larger deficits for longer. Um, this consolidation, of course, is very large, uh, right? It's potentially larger and longer lasting than even that of Thatcher. So the Thatcher um, spending cuts were actually uh, of very uh, long duration. UK was spending less in 1990 than it was in 1984. So that uh, six year period is not just a matter of getting spending down, but keeping it down once it's down. Uh, Thatcher was. Um, uh, out on her own in terms of the international historical experience in regards to that, that mid-1980s spending control period. Um, the largest cuts in any one year in the UK with over, were around 4% in total spending um, imposed by the IMF in the mid-1970s. Now these constitute around just over <coughs> 4% over a longer period, not all in one year, um, but the, the cut in the underlying spending of around, uh, of around £80 billion pounds is really um, out there on its own, especially in terms of the concentration of spending cuts in particular departments. So one thing that you might be tempted to do would be just to say, well, it's all just too much, right? We don't need to do this much. Uh, now, you can tell a tale which says cutting so much so, so fast is likely to induce a double dip 
recession. And then you could claim, if you, there is a double-dip recession, you could claim vindication for the strategy. There's, there will be people who uh, want to do that. Uh, especially as, in fact, well, um, contrary to uh, what Chris Hume has said, double-dip recessions are extremely common in the UK. In fact, every recession um, in, since quarterly records began has resulted in a double-dip of some sort in the UK. Uh, around half the time, those double-dips are just brief one quarter blip and then you start recovering again and at half time they're at their, their own full-blown second leg of recession. So for example in the early 1990s there was just a quick, quick blip and then we started going rapidly again whereas in the 70s, the 50s and the 80s then that second leg was its own recession. Um, now that, that might seem like a tempting strategy but I, I think that that's a, a politically dangerous strategy for a number of reasons. So one kind of obvious one is that it um, leaves you a little bit the, uh, the hostage of events. Okay? Because regardless of the underlying merits of the case, things in the economy are intrinsically very uh, uncertain, and there must be a, a risk that if you stake all your chips on there being a double dip, and there wasn't one, then you're a little bit silly. Um, but more, uh, but, or I think there will be a double dip, so the risk, so although there is that risk, I don't think that risk is that large. Um, more importantly, though, is the risk of uh, seeing irrelevant, because actually the majority position is that uh, most people think that the fiscal consolidation, the fiscal consolidation around the scale, is necessary. Most economists, uh, and most of them think that that is true, even though they expect the consolidation in its early phases to bear down on growth. Now, my view is slightly different, right? So I think that if stepping aside perhaps Q1 of next year with the VAT rise, everything apart from the VAT rise, I think is likely to be stimulative to growth. But if, let's ignore that point just for now. Most people disagree with me on that. So they think that though there will be, um, though it's good to do it, it will have some sh negative short-term impact. So um, what's likely to happen there is that if you get some double dip, especially once you're in, people aren't going to want to reverse policy. They think a U-turn would be a disaster. So once you're into the policy, you're going to find that people are going to line up to say, once there's a double dip, it's even more important that we cut now. And so then you're going to look very isolated. Um, there is a little bit of a uh, self-indulgent tendency in certain parts of the left to speak to itself on this particular matter. So you pick a couple of um, pet economists like Blanche Flam and Krugman, and then you start then say, well, Blanche Flam and Krugman say that it's a terrible idea to cut now. And then, then somehow it slips from the fact that Blanche Flam and Krugman are quite illustrious to a claim that no serious economist thinks that we should cut now. And then, then, the, then you end up speaking to yourself because you then define a serious economist as any good that agrees with you on this particular point. Uh, the, 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 the blunt reality is that the economics community is split on this, but that the, a goodly a majority of them are of the view that it's necessary to cut um, at this stage. So the danger for you with, with the strategy of opposing the scale of the cuts is that in a situation where your economic credibility is already low, then you end up setting much of the economic community against you, particularly if things go badly. And, that, uh, and I think that that will be a very hard sell because, as I say, I don't think the public's interested in giving you a fair hearing on a number of these questions anyway. So. Um, I think the danger of that is that you'd end up with even more of the consequences of the recession pinned on labour. So I think that's a, a seductive but dangerous strategy. The second kind of strategy might be to oppose the mix. So you might say, for example, there should be more tax rises. I think this is a little bit more plausible than the first strategy. Uh, the coalition has gone for 77, 23. There could be, you could imagine um, having uh, something lower, perhaps a 60-40 ratio. Now, one, one danger down this path would be to imagine that you can do this through tax rises just on the rich. So the richest 10% of people in the UK have, a, um, have total pre-tax income of about uh, £250 billion. Their total post-tax income is around £150 billion. So if you think that you can get, say, an extra £50 billion out of them through additional tax rises per year, then you'd be proposing to take away something like one third of their current post-tax income. Well, quite apart from the fact that um, 
they won't hang around in the UK to be taxed at that level. They might well not be the richest 10% anymore once you'd impose that sort of level of the taxation on them, taking more than 60% of their um, income on average. Uh, so I, I just don't think that the rich have enough money for you to take, for you to really address this problem by taxes on the rich. If you're going to increase taxes, then you're going to have to buy the bullet and say we're going to have a higher basic rate of income tax, in my view. So there, there's an argument to be had down that line. Our basic rate is extraordinarily low, at only 20%. Um, and so there must be a, a strong argument for uh, increasing the role of basic rate income tax in the total tax mix. And one opportunity to do that would be just like, but just to raise the basic rate. Um, now, that, that you would need a new tail to go with that. So one aspect of that tail might be why you didn't raise the basic rate when you were in office. And so that's, a bit tricky. So that's obviously a tricky aspect of the story. Um, and I also think that then you would need some, probably need some outriders, some think tanks or whatever, to try to set up the argument as to why it was desirable to have a higher level of um, income tax. Uh, that, that seems to me to be um, a very difficult sell, at least in the short term. If one were really going to go down the path of saying we need a really much higher basic rate of income tax because, um, say, 30% as a basic rate would be um, much more natural, places more in line with Scandinavian economies and arguments of that sort, um, I think that that is an argument to be won over a scale of decades, probably, uh, rather than the scale of the next few years. Uh, so that would be a brave strategy. Uh, might work over the longer term, probably would see you out of office for quite a while. A third strategy might be just to um, oppose the detail. And there'll be plenty of opportunities for that. Because what we've got is some departments having cuts of 25, 40% in their current spending. That's the, uh, that's the plan. So it's all very pretty to think about that in principle, and the public at this stage uh, seem to be sympathetic to the notion that there need to be cuts, uh, significant cuts, they say. But once it comes down to finding out the detail of what, what that means, that specific programs that they're interested in get cut, that the childcare down um, at their, at their local uh, childcare centre, their sure start, or the, that school that they thought was going to be built in their area doesn't get built. Once you come into the detail of the thing, then people are going to um, find that, they, uh, that the principle is less attractive than they thought in the first place. Uh, now, Andy Burnham has uh, sort of set out one variant of this, particularly bold variant of this, with his sort of what's called his Emperor's New Clothes moment of saying that uh, actually it was a mistake for the coalition to ring fence spending on the NHS. Uh, and so there, w there might be a strategy, I and mean, that would be a particularly brave one. The average GP earns £110,000 a year, and if you looked at that BBC panorama um, list of all the richest people, it was something like seven of the top 20 were doctors. It's absolutely extraordinary, I mean, the doctors earning nearly £450,000 a year. So um, there, there is, that would be a very brave way to go. I don't quite know how that would mix with um, Labour's uh, electoral coalition. So maybe one wouldn't. Maybe one might not get so far as to particularly attack the NHS. But there's got to be lots of scope for attacking other detail of, of, the, um, of the of the mix. So you might say, well, we shouldn't actually be cutting this school. We should be cutting that instead. But there's an awful, one of the problems with that strategy is that there's an awful lot of work, right? because it's very, it's going to be very difficult for you to work out um, how to produce a coherent plan altogether saying, well, we should cut that, we should cut that. Because, of course, what you've got at the moment is teams, you know, thousands upon thousands of, of civil servants all thinking about the detail of this. And so the danger of um, coming up with something that wasn't credible by saying, well, we shouldn't cut this, and instead should, um, should cut that, and then finding out the thing that you say we should cut just turns out not to be feasible to cut at all, must be quite high. Uh, so. That, that's again uh, a strategy would be that I think that's a, a, a good <coughs> strategy. The last of the options I'm going to offer to you is that maybe if you were to focus on jobs 
rather than growth. Because um, although, so the academic evidence is that usually large fiscal consolidations, especially if they're focused on spending cuts, promote growth even in the short term rather than the, um, uh, and particularly over the long term. So there's all kinds of reasons for this, which I don't need to rehearse. But um, a key uh, fact which I think that a lot of the current debate has missed is that although growth is often stimulated by spending cuts, unemployment has almost always risen in large fiscal consolidations. Perfectly possible to get growth accelerating and unemployment going up. So for example in the UK, um, output started growing in the second half of 1981, but unemployment continues to grow until 1984. Uh, and I think it's perfectly plausible that on this occasion what we find is that although the economy starts to uh, grow, we get continuous rises in unemployment over the next few years. So another kind of strategy would be to um, set aside, and so of course one has to talk about growth every now and then, but if one particularly focused on the jobs aspect, and said that the key here is to go about these things in a way which minimizes the impact on jobs, I think that, that one's likely, the, the chances of being appearing vindicated, at least on the surface, are going to look pretty high, because the reality is going to be that, um, I, I think, that we just aren't going to get the private sector jobs growth that makes up for the public sector job losses. So um, that's a, uh, that would be another way to go. Um, so one last thing that I want to say is that, uh, I think that the Labour Party needs to find a new language to describe uh, public spending. When nearly half of those in the South and key southern swing voters uh, believe that the bulk of spending was wasted, uh, I don't think that you can keep on with the line of describing all public spending as investment. Uh, I mean, quite apart from the fact that it's just not true, right? Is it? I mean, it's not true that um, enormously raising the, the GP. Uh, salaries is an investment. The, 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 uh, but even <coughs> setting aside, so even setting aside the question of whether it's fundamentally true, I just don't think that it's fundamentally credible to talk about investment to these particular people. So you need to find a new language to describe what's going on when in in terms of public spending that reaches out to people who are doubtful about the merits of what you've done. Um, now that might be as part of a uh, an overall strategy where you rethink a little what it, what's going on in terms of what the Labour Party is about. So it might be that, so we, you see that um, some uh, thinkers on the left, uh, and I think uh, Ed Miliband is actually um, signed up with some of this uh, thinking, want to say that, uh, that they shouldn't abandon the communitarian agenda, the civil society agenda, to um, Cameron's people. And that actually things like trade unions, for example, are important elements of civil society, um, binding forces and um, important uh, foci of communities. But, uh, and so it's possible that your new language might be connected with a slightly different concept of what the Labour Party was about, that it wasn't just about trying to maximise the amount of public spending at every opportunity, which I think is, I don't think, think, think that that's really what the Labour Party was ever about, but I think there was the danger of um, there being a sort of knee-jerk assumption that it was always better to be raising spending as much as one could. Uh, and so I think that there might be that, um, uh, th that, that that new language as an alternative to investment might be placed within the context of a more communitarian um, socialist vision. That's, that's all I have to say for now. So any questions? Uh, well, thank you very much indeed. I uh, enjoyed that um, for the, uh, the person seminar. Um, <coughs> so I didn't click out your name. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm Andrew Luke. Okay. Yeah, so I, just, I was reading your article earlier, but just um, the five things you need to know. Mm. Okay. Um, so I'm Patrick McGee, um, Vice Chancellor of the University of East London. I come on to higher education. Um, please ask some questions of clarification, just so I'm absolutely clear. Yep. Where some, first of all, you said um, early on that. The, uh, it was your view, though I think you said not majority view, I'm sure appears that the uh, fiscal consolidation measures that are kicking in in the next um, year or so, leaving aside the AT, you thought in fact would stimulate the economy. That's right. Now, can you just talk me through why that's the case? And why it's minority opinion? Okay, so 
the uh, so what the literature so there's an quite, quite extensive literature on this um, what it says is that if you cut that cuts in spending tend to stimulate growth even in the short term especially if they are cuts in consumption spending so if you can find ways to cut um, government salary bills and so for example if you can find ways to reduce headcount uh, if you can cut um, certain um, uh, other other aspects of government consumption so things that government buys which have a short-term impact rather than being um, buildings and uh, investments of that sort then that tends to stimulate growth uh, there's a number of reasons why you might expect that so one is that uh, economies with high levels of government consumption grow more slowly over the longer term on average the relationship is that something like each 1% increase in GDP takes about 0.1 to 0.15 off the growth rate, long-term growth rate of the economy. So if, you're, if you were to be spending, so if you raise spending from say 40 to say 50% of GDP, which is not far from what was done between 2007-8 and 2010-11, then you'd be expecting to take something nigh on um, 1 to 1.5% 1 off the annual growth rate of your economy. So instead of growing at 2.5% a year, you'd only be growing up one and a half one. Mm -hmm. So what, over the longer term, then that has quite a large impact, of course, on people's wealth, if you have the, that kind of change. So if people, if the economy is going to be growing more rapidly over the longer term, then in the short term as well, people will be more confident that, they, that over time their salary is going to rise so as to be able to service their debts, um, that they, so their expectations of their mm -hmm. lifetime wealth are going to be higher. So because they are going to expect feel richer over their whole lifetimes, then they're willing to spend more in the short term. That's effect one. Mechanism two is if you um, cut spending when there are large deficits, you reduce the fear in the public mind that the deficit will be addressed by raising taxes. So if you, so if you have a large deficit uh, and, and then people might worry that what will actually happen is that they'll whack up my taxes. So the first effect the growth effect was that um, I would that people would expect that their pre-tax wages will be higher over the longer term. This one says that my post-tax wages will be higher because I'm not going to have to pay as much tax. And the third effect is the one that everybody talks about. I don't think it's as important as the first two, which is that if you have very large deficits, then you can run the risk that um, bond markets lose confidence in you. Then you have a spike up in interest rates. Uh, as a consequence, and that can be very deleterious for investment. So those three are key factors. Now, and there's lots of evidence um, on these kind of things. The European Commission did a uh, survey a few years ago of uh, 49 major fiscal consolidations. In 24 of those cases, they uh, so these were all fiscal consolidations, uh, all except for the uh, two of them were fiscal consolidations, which were much smaller in scale uh, than we than we were dealing with. Here, so the much smaller deficits than we have. Uh, so they're talking about deficits of three, four percent of GDP, and then they down. Of these uh, 49, in 24 of the cases, growth was stimulated even in the short, short run as a consequence of the deficit. Uh, and in fact, in 11 of those cases, that was true even without any loosening of monetary policy. Right. Um uh, the risk of getting way out of my but my response would be. The, you mentioned pre-tax, post-tax, and then longer-term international market confidence. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the third one, I, I, can, I can see that I taking that back the same time. I mean, intuitively, as a non-economist, um, I would have thought that the first two elements, um, uh, even leaving aside the fact that they would make take some time to kick in, um, would be more than offset by the fact that you're taking, you know, a whole salary of your economy, and I mean, what that model basically is saying that if you have a civil servant, a sort of you know archetypal um, uh, paper pusher, um, who maybe is, is on I don't know, take home pay of thirty thousand pounds, you would say, you just you're just kicking thirty thousand pounds out of the economy. Um, you don't have the thirty thousand pounds. That's kind of was a, was a secondary consideration. And I would have thought, sure, two hundred fifty thousand jobs being lost in the public sector. Let's say um, that's a lot of money to take out of the economy. I would have, I would have thought, in the, at least in the shorter term. That uh, loss, would, that spending part, would more than um, offset um, the fact that I buy a slightly more expensive car because I think interest rates will not 
Um, well, so but I'm just the case. Excuse me. No, well, it's it's absolutely the case that there is an argument, right? There's a, there's a there there are theoretical arguments that go uh, both ways on these particular uh, discussions, but the the empirical data. So I, I've always been more persuaded by the empirical arguments that said, under most circumstances, um, uh, running large deficits neither stimulates nor particularly damages uh, growth. If you run very large deficits, then they're likely to damage, be damaging to growth. Uh, and, and there will be circumstances under which running deficits is stimulatory, particularly if you have a, an impaired banking sector. Um, so, but on the side of spending, um, in, in my view, one doesn't spend because it promotes growth. We, we, the government, so the government spends for more broader reasons of social policy. It, it spends because it wants to help the poor in particular ways, or it wants to facilitate certain kinds of social transfers. Um, it isn't that the, the vast uh, absolutely well. So no, preventing riots, of course, would be positive for growth. Uh, but uh, the uh, the point that I'm making there is that I don't think it's the right way to think about government spending as being something like to figure it. Just to take take up these things in my head. Um, uh, and again, the the the, the study you, you you referred to is very interesting. Let's have a look at that, but. Uh, again, uh, this will exasperate you. Um, uh, one, I'm sure you've looked at this, forgive me, but um, it might not be a causal relationship, it could be some third element kicking in there. I mean, if, if you get governments with a fiscal consolidation policy, you probably also get a deregulation dynamic in the, in the economy, but it may not be, there may be some causal um, uh, leakage, but it may not be entirely that. So uh, that's it. Um, uh, the, one, the one thing that I, I would like to just to add on this point is. So there's also so the, the, but the, there's this European Commission work. You, you might particularly be interested in work by Alicina if you're academically inclined. So there's a, an American academic who's like the foremost authority on these uh, matters uh, called Alicina, uh, and he has done. He's been uh, looking at this matter for decades. Other bodies, including the IMF and so on. So um, now, one thing that I want to say is that uh, though I'm reasonably persuaded that this literature and you know, some people have been foolish enough to listen to me on, the, uh, on these particular points. Um, I have always urged that you shouldn't rely upon my arguments here. I, so, that although I think that it's perfectly likely that, um, it's probably m more likely than not that the consolidation will promote growth even in the short term, even without losing a manager po energy policy, that's not an experiment I'm interested in conducting. Uh, so I wanted to see um, the fiscal consolidation combined with a significant further loosening of monetary policy, lots of additional quantitative easing. And I'm rather mystified as to why the Bank of England isn't already doing that. I mean, uh, perhaps they're waiting to go in November once, they, once the detailed uh, announcements come in in October. But I think, I think they're running out of time on this. We need, we, we, I don't think we should be, I think it's just foolishness to be relying upon the case which says that uh, these that a consolidation on this scale will promote growth even in the short term, because of, because there must be a risk that even if it would be desirable, um, it would uh, it damage growth in the short term, even if it would be necessary or even if it were desirable over the longer term, that it would damage growth in the short term. And uh, I'm just not interested in finding out the whole the broader economic situation is so fragile. Uh, that it, um, I, I say, I just think it would be foolishness not to combine uh, that fiscal consolidation, like fiscal consolidation on this scale, with considerable further loosening in energy policy through additional quantitative easing. I'm going to my honourable member from Saint Louis West. Thank you very much, uh, Tom Wadsworth from Network Rail. Um, we've got a couple of questions. First being, okay, you've, you've set out a number of options that the Labour Party could pursue, um, and I think you're sort of you've analysed them in terms of their electoral credibility. Um, uh, how, how do you, if you're in Milan, how do you square the circle of dealing with the unions in particular, um, and the public sector unions in particular, who are going to be uh, putting you under a lot of pressure, um, both financially and, and emotionally, if you like, uh, to avoid cuts, um, but at the same time not then end up uh, kind of alienating that potential uh, southeast vote, if you like, and, and for example, large rises in income tax, which would 
hits everybody and therefore upsets a lot of the electorate rather than a, a small portion that happens to spend a lot of money on you. So uh, I think that it's I think that it's quite plausible that a good strategy from the uh, from the Miliband point of view is to embrace the unions to get a bit closer to them. Um, but one has to find the right set of unions to get closer to, and one has to find the right approach to that. So the mistakes in terms of embracing unions would be to connect oneself too closely to the public sector so as to become seen as a narrow representative of a sectional interest in the public sector and in opposition to spending cuts. That would be a mistake. A second mistake would be to be too intimately connected with specific large unions. So I would see the uh, opportunity for the Labour Party in respect of unions to be part of this movement towards a more traditional socialist notion where um, it wasn't that uh, the state was necessarily the answer to every problem. The more traditional socialist concept had workers um, uh, operating together, that the workers combined to solve certain of their problems themselves through um, cooperatives, through uh, trade unions. And uh, I think that engaging more with that agenda is actually quite attractive. Now, the, as I say, the, um, the tricky thing is that that might at some point mean setting yourself against very large unions. In my view, certain of the unions are just too big. They actually are monopoly suppliers, services some of the very large cross-sectoral unions now. Uh, and I suspect that uh, a properly conducted competition assessment would decide that some of these would be better broken up than uh, that. But I don't, I don't necessarily expect any of the bands would embrace that agenda anytime soon. But if somebody else were to do that for him, uh, I think that might be quite convenient in terms of providing an opportunity to engage with slightly smaller uh, union. Uh, so really, probably a more attractive notion than that for him is rather than, uh, is to be pro-union, but pro-private sector union. So he needs to come up with a tale and a vision of what it is that private sector unions can offer to private sector workers, so as to try to reinvigorate um, private sector union membership. And the, so there was this, I was at an event last night, and um, uh, Douglas Alexander was yes. telling an uh, anecdote about how his, uh, one of his civil servants decided that she cancelled her union membership because it cost about the same as the gym, and she got much more out of the gym. Uh, and that, that kind of um, sentiment, I think, is quite widespread. People don't really understand what it is that unions are supposed to do for them in many cases. Uh, and so if, if you could tell a tale where a private sector unions did something other than creating trouble, okay, if there was some sort of concept of um, unions as service providers, as coordination for various uh, community building uh, uh, and Community building might not just be geographic community, but might be, as it were, a community of workers. Uh, perhaps as devices for reaching out internationally, connecting with workers in other countries. Um, a lot of that, and I think that there, you could imagine um, them playing a key role as part of the communitarian society. And one thing about that is that some of the measures which the coalition might pursue, if it's successful in some of its own communitarian agenda, then that that if if that works then the Labour Party isn't left behind because it has its own particular sort of contribution there to make uh, by the role of the, of the, of the working uh, the workers. Well, a slightly different question, um, and you know, coming very much from the Network Road point of view here, um, we would argue that uh, investment in infrastructure that actually uh, brings you some demonstrable or forecast economic benefit in the longer term, um, uh, the continued investment in such uh, infrastructure is it's common sense and something government ought to be doing even in, in a, a recession or a, or a downturn. Um, and, and the current government seems to have, uh, seems to broadly agree with that notion. And do you think that's right? Um, do you think that's a credible strategy for, for Labour to pursue? Um, and how do you think these things should be judged against one another? And um, how do you decide whether it's a hospital or a school or a high-speed rail link? Well, I'm going to be speaking at an event tomorrow evening on, uh, on transport, so I, I shan't give you my whole spiel on that uh, just now. On the sort of broader question of uh, infrastructure investment, well, there are a lot of 
who think that the uh, best order of uh, stimulatory government action is uh, public investment, tax cuts, government consumption. Uh, now, uh, so that is that if the, the worst thing to cut is public uh, infrastructure. And so in that you should prefer to raise taxes before you cut public infrastructure. I'm doubtful about that for a number of reasons. Particularly, I think that that's more plausible as a strategy when you have relatively modest recessions. When you have very large recessions, that's that's partly because uh, the there's been a changed outlook for the future, a significant structural change of some sort, and it can be very difficult to predict what the longer term consequences of that uh, are. So, one of the implications of that is that. There's a large danger that when you go about your great public works schemes, you end up being the wrong things, right? So you end up building railways where nobody wants them, or um, some other fancy transport infrastructure, or you build a load of houses anticipating that people are going to continue to move to a particular region as they always did, and you find that actually one of the implications of this recession is that um, people start locating somewhere completely different. Uh, and the experience of, say, Japan in the 1990s and early 2000s is not happy in this regard. Right? They spent an awful lot on various um, make work, public work schemes, kept a lot of people very busy. It, it had a reasonable effect on the GDP statistics right? because the people were actually, they weren't bored uh, to, uh, during the recession. But other, and we ended up at the end of it with some very nice shiny bridges and roads, and they're still shiny because nobody actually uses them. And so uh, uh, that, that would be the great fear that I would have on this particular occasion. So I guess my, my overall message is that I see the strategy of um, carry on regardless or perhaps do even more public infrastructure in a recession as something which is more suited to relatively small recessions than to very large ones, such as the current, uh, the current one. And uh, so I would have thought that the focus should have been, in the first place, in terms of fiscal policy, more on um, tax cuts of various sorts than on large spending rises. Uh, and although I see the case for not um, cutting public infrastructure in the next few years any more than is necessary, I think that the cuts in government consumption are already going to be so enormous that to say we're not going to do the, these cuts in capital spend, we're going to do even more cuts in government consumption, probably takes us beyond the realms of political feasibility. In terms then of uh, how you sort of forward plan, I suppose, uh, would you so, say you talk to the issue of housing? Um, now, presumably, then you'd have to get a more uh, market led uh, approach where you sort of encourage house builders, for example, to, to make their own decisions about where they think that the housing is going to be and invest themselves. Do you then you then go down the sort of route that the regional uh, bodies did before and kind of sort of pump prime that, or is that fall into the same category, or do you encourage local authorities or regional bodies, whatever they happen to be, to cut taxes in particular areas to encourage growth in Swindon or wherever it happens to be? And then, uh, what, what do you do, or do you just think, okay, we've got to get ourselves through the recession and then, then the market will react? Well, obviously, house building is something which is um, which reacts particularly strongly to changes in, the, uh, in house prices uh, and it also reacts to things like planning controls and so on. Um, now, one thing on the, on the house building side is that house building has fallen away a lot over the past 30 years or so. Um, the, the largest driver of that is the drop in social housing rather than in uh, uh, private dwellings of various sorts. Uh, now, I'm, uh, I have to say that I'm uh, relatively skeptical about the tale which says that we have some sort of housing crisis. Um, uh, my things that I've seen on the data suggest that uh, actually we've tended to build houses faster than the growth in um, the number of households, even during the 1990s, that was true. Um, and that a lot of the tales that we had about how in the 1990s we weren't nearly keeping pace and there were all these housing crises, once we went away and we actually counted them in the census, turned out to be wrong. They were just statistical errors. Now, it could well be that we've corrected all those statistical problems 
so that when people are saying now that we're not building houses nearly fast enough to keep up with the growth of the number of households in various regions, maybe they're right this time. Uh, personally, I'd rather see some actual evidence in the data. I'd rather go and see another count and convince myself that, the, that, that we were getting it right this time, haven't got it wrong uh, the last time so spectacularly before I, before I thought that there should be a, a large policy change in this particular area. Um, now, in terms of what I would do, well, I'd, I think there are all kinds of possibilities of what I might do in terms of in regional location. You could, for example, I remember a few years ago, try to persuade the uh, treasury of a scheme where you would, um, uh, where local authorities would be able to uh, trade uh, development with each other. But uh, sticking more to my policy exchange hat, of course, we recently produced a a rather interesting study on housing associations suggesting that housing associations might raise more of their finance and um, equity basis rather than through uh, loans uh, and so that's another that's a, I would commend that paper to you as something that would be worth reading on the topic um, I don't think that you want to address uh, serious fiscal problems, sorry, serious recession problems with local tax changes. So when I talk about tax cuts and so on, I'm talking about things like a temporary tax rebate in the style of the, uh, the Bush rebate or the Obama rebate in the US. So those sorts of um, temporary large income tax cuts are the uh, are rapidly reversed income tax cuts are the kind of thing that I have in mind. I don't have in mind little local regional cuts, I don't think that those are likely to be working very well. Can you just uh, come in there? Bring the whole discussion to Bill Circle. Um, you said you said earlier on, quite understandable, um, that uh, the left didn't continue to label whole public expenditure as investment. But some of it is, I would say. It is. Um, in particular, I'd be expected to say this at rather self so If you look at universities, um, and the, the numbers vary up and down the country, but in one institution, Direct government grant accounts for less than a third of my total revenue. Um, Hefty, over the past few years, have advocated and encouraged the threshold that every institution should return a surplus of around the 3% on the turnover. But in fact, for 2008 and 2009, that surplus was only 1.3%, but for the surplus. One institution is near 9% for all kinds of reasons. Um, but having said that, um, the £45 million pounds I get from Hefty every year is delightful and I uh, receive it with open arms. Uh, when they look at the um, investment in the science infrastructure or look at the investment in uh, universities and, and in certain regions there is no other um, uh, uh, kind of uh, intellectual um, asset in some of the money. Um, when we look at either of those two elements, there's a reasonable case we made that invest, spend, spend on universities is in fact investment and historical data shows that. And if you look specifically at sub-regions like the Northeast, um, <laughs> even if you're only ambitious to, you know, say something positive about how you might help them come out of um, a recession, you'd say, well, we're supporting uh, the local uh, universities there. But generally speaking, um, what is your view about the um, model around um, public spend? on universities in the context of universities being, in fact, net um, uh, wealth creators uh, and job creators. For every job a university creates, another piece of creating the economy. What's your general view in terms of university investment? Well, universities are also, of course, um, uh, major international oh, businesses. Yeah. They're still one of, uh, the, one of the UK's, um, probably uh, one of the UK's top few uh, major global uh, status positions in terms of global industries. Uh, and so, what, what my view on the universities in general is it's a mistake to focus too much on those areas in which universities uh, add growth value. Because where the greatest growth is created by them is also likely to be the areas where there's the greatest scope for private sector uh, action. So if, if, if some sort of research is particularly growth enhancing, then in general, it's likely to be that there's some money to be made out of that. So private funds could replace the public funds. Um, it, I would see um, 
Uh, so uh, one of the dangers of thinking in two utilitarian terms here is that one then leaves all the um, most straightforward investment opportunities as public sector investment. And then one cuts back on all of the, the Latin and the um, 17th century English literature and those kind of things where it's very difficult to make a direct connection with any output. When actually it's the latter category that it would that that um, it's the there's the least opportunity for other kinds of uh, monies to fund research in. Um, another thing that I would say on universities is that so there's a question on the research side. There's also of course the question on the funding side. Uh, now, personally, I'm, there, there are a number of things that one might say. And of course, past exchanges like which I will tell you is that. Uh, what should happen here is that the uh, you remove the subsidy, much of the subsidy from loans, so that um, particularly for uh, relatively well off people. So you focus the loan subsidy on those who are less well off, and um, that's one kind of a, an option. It seems to me that once one's gone that far, then there might be other things to that would be worth considering. Right. So once you have commercial level loans across a large swathe of the population, then um, Actually, it's probably better if those loans are made by um, private businesses, banks and so on. One of the interesting things that governments can do in some of this area is actually get um, uh, you uh, get things going to the point at which uh, you establish sufficient track record in an industry that the private sector can come in. So it's a kind of infant industry argument for the public sector involvement. And you might think that actually the public, that um, government intervention here had largely done its work right, in, that, in that particular area. You've, you've got a, um, a, a large increase in the number of universities and the number of university places, and so that then creates considerable scope for the, it gives you enough track record that the private sector then has confidence in making loans. However, I wouldn't quite go that far as to say that you could just leave things as they are. What I would be interested in seeing is uh, investigation of the possibility of providing a default form of finance by the state, which would definitely uh, work for everybody in the sense of giving them access, which is the following, that you say, you, if you can get a loan in the private sector, then great, you know, then, then stick with that. If you can't get a loan from the private sector, or if you prefer to come with us because you don't like loans, then what we will do is that we will take a portion of your salary above a certain cap. So this is a bit like a graduate tax, except that what, what you're doing is that you're just um, trading an equity stake. So the government provides upfront finance for you, and what happens there is that in, in trade for that upfront finance, you agree to pay a certain percentage of your salary uh, thereafter. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's not that you tax all graduates, it's just that you tax these ones. So the, one of the things about that, of course, is that there's then no debt associated with the scheme, so nobody's disincentivized by debt. It's unattractive for many people relative to a loan, because in most cases you're going to be surrendering a larger proportion of your salary. But if you're focused on relatively low, um, uh, low income activities, then, you, then you're only surrendering a very small proportion of your salary. Uh, only about a small cap. Um, so those kind of, I, I think that there are actually uh, options on financing here which uh, would take us quite a long way from where we are now. Um, so the, the point that I make, so one last thing that I would say there is that higher education is likely to be pretty significantly cut given the scale of the um, spending cuts which are going, and one of the consequences of that is going to be enormously greater uh, charging freedom for universities. Uh, that's just going to happen. 